Metal Gear is dead. The franchise that brought us the stealth action genre and its spin-off seems to be finished. But what about all those things from the past of Metal Gear or gaming at large that never made it into this series? What about the lost potential? Everyone has their fantasy of Snake infiltrating some awesome fortress in the Fox engine, or a Metal Gear game with co-op stealth infiltration, or maybe a Metal Gear that takes one of their favorite subgenres of game and expands on it like Metal Gear Acid did. The old KJP team that remained after Kojima was fired pulled my personal vision of a spinoff of this franchise out of my head, made it, and hid it from me in plain sight for over two and a half years. And now I can't stop playing it or thinking about it. Metal Gear Survive is a game about the death of the Metal Gear franchise. More specifically, it's an allegorical retelling of the Inferno poem by the Italian author Dante Alighieri via a rolling, temporally retrograde recurring apocalypse multiverse created through time travel by a high-minded, world-eating kaiju composed of densified sentient nanodust particles from the future. Got it? You're playing as your own crafted avatar, killed and reborn out of the end of this decade-spanning franchise, which is in-universe at 1975, equating MSF's destruction with the death of Metal Gear, and you're flung into a topsy-turvy version of the world named Dite that looks and plays more like Fortnite in Call of Duty zombie mode more than Metal Gear. In this way, the game holds true to the franchise's meta-gaming story format, dialing back its stealth action to allow the more popular formats of these recent times to determine the game's form for this dead entry. The format of the game is just as twisted and contorted as the plot itself, and it may look awkward from the outside, but once you play it yourself, your view at the end might change a lot from your first impressions. The story itself is born out of a kind of fusion of Terminator, Godzilla, and an appropriation of the Bacterian hive mind threat from the Gradius series, and it's cheesy with a heart. But the story of the single player portion of the game is only a small part of the whole game appropriately, and the real story is what we ourselves write after the pages are done turning, sharing our tales and creating new ones with other players. There isn't much left to tell. All the main characters are gone, and we're left with the scattered remnants of MSF's support crews salvaging what energy can still be had from this world. But you do get to kill Kaiju with Sahelanthropus' railgun. Which is neat. Before I get going any further, let me be clear about where I'm coming from. I really like this game. I didn't give it a chance when it came out and only purchased it earlier this year in 2020. I've had it for about three months now and have had a lot of fun discovering all the different parts of the game on my own and then also coming into a decent community online with a few other players. After I found myself enjoying this game so much, I started to think back on what all the YouTubers and other reviews said about the game when it came out, and of course I see it now as mostly bullshit. I'm not interested in all of that mess here. I want to talk about why this game is good and what I love about it. And after going online and searching for just one video of someone extolling all the virtues and ins and outs of this entire game from the end game, I found that video just didn't exist. Everyone that's made positive videos about this game has done it at some point I've played past, and let me tell you, there's a lot of game to play here. I'm over 300 hours into this game, and I'm still not done gaining experience. I'm not even to the end of the end game of this game yet. Just making this video and recording footage of myself playing has shown me a few things I've been overlooking or could do better at in the future. The skill ceiling to this game is impressive, despite its single player campaign only taking maybe 15 to 20 hours to complete. Between all the different things you have to learn in this game in order to become really good at it though, you'll be looking at closer to probably 400 plus hours over several months to reach the master level of this game. Hell, at my 300 plus hours, I'm still not done maxing all the classes available. I haven't even played a whole entire subclass a single time, so even I don't know everything about this game yet. Don't let anyone tell you that this was just some easy cash grab by Konami meant to pull in a few easy bucks to recoup MGSV's production costs. This is its own game that deserves to be seen as such. It's not some DLC or some afterthought, it's a whole damn game. Give it some respect. You remember when Angry Joe's game review said that the game was all fences and poking zombies with sticks? I kinda have to laugh when I see that clip now, because he's so transparently a bad actor. He had no idea what this game was. And really no one did in early 2018, except for really I guess maybe a dedicated few. Here in 2020, there are still achievements in this game with less than 1% completion rate across all owners on PC. Just over 50% have never done one single salvage mission, and thus have never played with even one other player. 
and at PC launch, the game peaked at just over 5,500 concurrent players on Steam, dropping off within two months to its stable, long-term player count, averaging between maybe 30 and 100 per day on the platform. Comparatively, Angry Joe's review of Survive sits at over 3.8 million views today. So much for all those I want to co-op Metal Gear fans, huh? This game is the slowest burn of all the Metal Gear series. It was made to last, albeit cheaply. It's not something you can complete quickly even if you have the time to dedicate. Konami's foray into mobile gaming makes a little show here with daily timers on certain in-game activities that you can only bypass with SV coins, the paid currency in-game much like Metal Gear Solid V's MB coins. But it's balanced and survives since the stuff that you're limited in doing gives you massive and rare rewards. You could say the game limits your daily play unfairly, or you could see it as the game encouraging you to not burn yourself out and to find a good medium effort for getting on by. You'll be surreptitiously herded into adjusting your perspective on playing the game from a daily one to a weekly one and eventually a monthly one by just playing and simply observing these paywalls and understanding them as limits on your play that aren't just placed there arbitrarily in the name of making money, but are in fact there in the name of balance. You don't need to pay a single extra dime past the purchase of the game to get the entire experience here. Once you get to the end game, the game establishes a nice pacing with the daily play habit, asking you to spend only 10 minutes if you just need to do the really important daily base defense. You get a nice reward for just logging on and doing that base defense, typically done automatically by your crew and requiring almost no effort by the player. If you continue, or really begin to play, you can get a daily reward for just doing two salvage missions in co-op, and if you can't find other players, the easier missions are quick and cheap enough to solo to farm the rewards quickly in under an hour. Collecting all the daily materials that accrue in your base might take another 10 minutes, and you can spend as long as you want out in the single player world collecting materials once you know all the good spots to hit. The game respawns items in the world based on the number picked up by the player, so you just find the right spots in the right order and you can make an infinite materials farming loop. But if you get lucky and find a group to run three or four missions in a row with, getting an S rank on salvages will have your storehouses overflowing with every material you've been struggling to find at all in single player. The game asks you to spend most of your resources on the hardest difficulty co-op matches in a group effort to in turn yield the game's greatest rewards. Farming in single player thus is comparatively a joke. You'll be hunting for animals, which you will continue to the end game to make the ever important revival pills, which function as this game's one up. Yes, you can farm infinite lives here and you will need to gather some amount of materials from the single player world to maintain a heavier daily play habit. Say, if you shoot a lot of guns, you might need to go out and get some gunpowder. But that's a fun activity for me to unwind, you know, put on some tunes, run around avoiding combat while I scavenge and I'm trying to optimize my route. It's not so bad. And when a group isn't around, there are still plenty of things to do daily past the base defenses and salvage missions. Side missions constantly spawn from crew at your base, giving you opportunities to collect gear crafting recipes, materials, Kuban energy from wormholes, more crew members, common and rare animal spawns outside of their typical locales, and even a pair of bosses, Big Mouth and Frostbite, you can kill again and again for some rarer rewards. If you choose to sit down and really play this game, you often won't run out of things to do, so you can always have your character sleep in base camp to refresh all your side missions. But before you get to the end game, there's a whole single player story to get through. The story starts you out with only the very basics, and some might call the game hard, but it's not exactly hard because it's difficult to navigate the map or fight the zombies. It's hard because the whole thing is an ordeal. You have to collect everything, almost from nothing, and some of the efforts required to activate teleporters or fight off hordes when you're required at first can seem almost impossible. But the game just has a steep learning curve. If you persist, you'll eventually find a strategy that works, or if you just go ask someone else. Given that the game's theme is survival, it's interesting to look at the global achievement stats to see who made it through how much of the whole ordeal. I mentioned earlier how few had played the multiplayer at all in the game, a measly 50%, and looking at the achievements along the single player campaign, you can see a pretty steady drop off of 1-5% to of players at each hurdle. Not many have what it takes to make it through a game this grueling. And it is grueling. The game teaches you how to swim like an overbearing parent. It chucks you in and watches you paddle and squirm and chug some dirty water until you learn to swim. There's a reason the Virgil AI voices are so annoying. If you're still doing the things that trigger the voice lines, you're probably not done learning to swim yet. At the very end game, the voice really will only appear when you go below, say, 15% stamina, or maybe at 40 or 50% oxygen remaining, maybe 10 or 20% remaining. 
and it doesn't even trigger every time. So it's really mostly a welcome reminder when it does pop up, but it's hardly the annoying thing that it will be during the campaign. The experience of your first 10 hours of play will seem foreign to you by 30 hours in. By the time you're done with the second map and have to come back to the first map, you'll almost be glad to revisit the starting zones with all your new progression and weapons and gadgets. Once you're taking on extreme salvage missions at max level after 150 hours, all of that early experience playing through the story gets put in a very different perspective. You're constantly expanding your capabilities in this game even after you hit max level, a nice 69. Specifically, there are 40 levels in the base survivor class, and post-game you unlock four subclasses with 29 levels each that you can equip one at a time on top of your base survivor class. The end game is about leveling up these subclasses with the gobs of Kuban you'll be getting from the co-op salvage missions, and then finding the class that suits exactly how you want to play and collecting all the gear to match that is a really satisfying thing to do as you play these missions over and over. So let's talk about the weapons. You start in the tutorial by crafting a crummy spear out of some iron piping and rags that barely knocks back wanderers and takes multiple hits direct to the head to net a kill. By the end of the game, you'll be crafting titanium glaives with napalm or liquid nitrogen applicators that can one-shot entire groups of wanderers with a well-timed dash attack. The spears are fun once you upgrade your ability to use them, but there are also three other classes of weapon light one-handed weapons, medium two-handed weapons, and heavy two-handed hammers. Even the one-handed melee weapons are satisfying, allowing you to aim them just enough to hit either a weak point at the back of the neck, or maybe take a leg off to disable your foe. The fact that this is a Metal Gear game with melee weapons should give you pause, because this is the closest to Guy Sauvage the canon has ever, or perhaps ever, will come, besides Rising Revengeance. And overall, the melee mechanics feel somewhat inspired by the From Software Soulsborne games, mostly Bloodborne from what I've heard others say. And then there's also a bow. Having a bow in a survival game to me is crucial. The bow is the quintessential survivalist's range weapon, one of humanity's oldest and most tested hunting tools. And here you start with a typical ramshackle bow, pieced together with some crummy wire, wood, and rags. But by the end of the game, you'll have plans and materials to craft the finest modern compound bow, aluminum arrows that do more damage, or fire frost and shock arrows, and even explosive arrows and RPAs, rocket propelled arrows. The bow has its own firing mechanics, requiring a button hold to draw an arrow back, then giving you a sound cue of a twang when the bow is fully drawn. Firing the bow at this sound cue will result in the longest and most accurate arrow flight path in addition to having more damage and a higher critical hit chance when certain skills equipped. The trajectory of your arrow depends on both the type of arrow and how far back you drew the bow before loosing. RPAs use a flat trajectory and can even pierce multiple enemies and are one of my favorite weapons. Once you've downed all the threats in an area with your bow, you can go back to the corpses and retrieve some arrows that hit their targets, either by harvesting them from the corpse or maybe picking them up off the ground. This only applies to normal heavy arrows though. All in all, the bow is maybe the most fun weapon in the game, allowing you to deal with hordes by setting the ground alight with fire arrows from afar, letting you permastun a bigger boss with repeated shock arrows, and even just using grenade arrows as an extra supply of explosives. With the way Survive's durability mechanics work, if you try to overuse any one weapon, you'll find yourself with the problem and typically just sticking to one thing is not an efficient playstyle in general in this game. It's not uncommon to see players in co-op carrying two of a gun they like to use a lot, as you can easily wear down the automatic guns with heavy use before a mission ends. Once any piece of equipment loses durability, it also loses effectiveness, meaning the more you swing a sword or fire a gun, the less damage it'll do. Although you really won't notice this until you start getting down to around about 60% durability on most weapons. You're encouraged to use the appropriate weapon for the situation in this way, as the game is constantly asking you how little resources will it take you to clear this hurdle and still have something left to get the next one and the next one. You only need to clear a hurdle by just enough to not hit it, and anything more than that is a waste. And this game teaches you that. Guns are the most complex weapons in terms of the parts lists, and as such have the most flexibility in offering you defense options on the battlefield at the cost of more materials. You learn the cost of using guns in this game very quickly, and so you learn to only use them at first when absolutely necessary. Later in the game, once you've built up enough stored materials, you can start letting loose. But then letting loose feels more like you've earned it, not like you're just spamming some infinite ammo supply to be automatically refilled when you return to base. Everything in this game feels earned, especially a well-placed sniper shot, which may have been expensive, but also probably saved you a ton of headache. And don't forget the gadgets. Metal Gear has always had great items that can be used in creative and inventive ways to great effect on the battlefield. You don't get any smokes in DTA, unfortunately, 
but most of the core items like explosives, distractions, and intel gathering items are here in a context that is balanced for a survival game. Most gadgets are one-time use, so their crafting cost is something you'll be constantly considering when you're using them. Even in the end game, the more mundane gadgets still have their use. Standard decoys or basic bait bottles can draw hordes of wanderers away when you need a little space on defense, or get them together around that explosive barrel you just placed. The game gives you four gadget slots to start with, and two equipable gadget slings add two more slots each if you want to carry enough stuff on your survivor to really beef up your defenses every salvage mission. Yet, the gadgets are just the beginning. Grenades are cool, but what's really awesome is a grenade turret. There are a slew of automated and leave-in-place defense items and structures available to your survivor that share slots with your gadgets. Everyone knows about the standard fences, and their advantage being you can shoot through them while the zombies pile up on the other side, and indeed that strategy will have its use all the way into the endgame for catching the stragglers that get through your other, more substantial defenses. You can easily build enough to automatically hold a point, and indeed will need to build these auto-defense formations to defend lanes in multiplayer while you're off doing whatever else needs your attention. There are also placeable manual 50 caliber gun turrets and motor tubes that you can combine with placeable guard towers to get full unimpeded fields of fire against oncoming foes. You can put down sandbags to elevate yourself or your turrets above the dangers of the passing hordes. There are electric fences for damaging any zombie that tries to climb it, hip high barricades that allow you to swing any melee weapon over, and making all these things work together with the map's natural contours is always a fun challenge. There are traps galore to be placed on the ground, including a trap for each type of elemental damage to help deal with the special element infused zombies you'll encounter on extreme salvage missions, and the sixth and final base defense. There are the precious air cannons, capable of keeping entire hordes of zombies back from the right choke point for as long as you will likely need. There are even automatic spinning blades that will take zombies out at the ankles for you. Finding what works is as simple as going into co-op and watching what other players do, or even going in yourself solo on an easier difficulty to try some new things. There are plenty of fun combos to discover, but the game as usual is about efficiency. Whatever does the most with the least resources required is good. Executing these kinds of setups always feels rewarding when they work. While the Kuban from Killing Hordes comes in, you can just sit back and watch your deadly zombie disposing Rube Goldberg machine work for you. There are also side missions to complete for extra energy or replenishing the items in your gadget belts. Side bosses worth extra energy can be killed, and managing the drill itself takes some babysitting. The drill has five speeds, and if you want to earn the most, you'll need to speed it up at least some every round using the shared energy earned during that mission. The catch is that as soon as the drill takes any damage, it loses its entire boost, sometimes leaving you without enough energy to restart the boost. It's kind of an all or nothing thing that the game's asking you to accomplish here. You can also use your team's extra energy earned on the mission for calling in ammo resupplies or spawning extra interceptor units like traps and turrets. And there's also a tactical heavy weapon that can be called in, which is usually a Metal Gear array that drops down and uses its laser to clear the entire map for you before jumping back up through its portal. Calling in the heavy always just feels great, but also can be key for helping your team kill the Devastators with their gigantic HP pools in the higher difficulties. And it's a lot of things to manage for one person, too much for all but the most practiced and skilled. There are two Devastators per extreme salvage mission, and maybe 350 to 450 Wanderers, Trackers, Bombers, Mortars, and even XOF Gunners to kill, plus an actual boss, either Big Mouth or Frostbite, off on their own in a sector of the map. Clearing extreme with an S plus rank yields Kuban in the order of the millions, compared to hundreds of thousands for hard, or tens of thousands for normal or easy, meaning the thing to do for experience is to simply get better and progress further. There are really no prizes for second place here. As the item tiers increase beyond gray and green, you start getting blue tiered gear that will have these extra option slots in the chest armor for carrying more ammo. But you'll barely be gathering enough gunpowder in single player to keep up with any regular firearm usage at that point, so you'll end up saving all that ammo for a boss. Well, as it turns out, the game is just training you for how to play at the hardest levels. You'll still want to kill as much as you can with melee weapons and gadgets in place defenses before falling back to relying on your guns to get you out of a jam. In fact, you'll need to save some ammo if you want to go off and kill Big Mouth or Frostbite quickly or help your teammates out with the Devastators on Extreme. And this planning really all ties in with things like picking out which ammo pouch you want to put on your gear and what weapon goes with that and it gives rise to your whole playstyle in a very nice organic way. The planning of what ammo and thus what gun to carry is just one aspect of the planning this game is asking and training you to take part in. You'll be gathering things like food and water which at first you'll need to find in the field, 
but eventually you can make an entire farm and build automatic water production facilities to get all of your consumables right there in base camp. You'll want to find a set of gear and weapons and gadgets that you can easily replenish and repair with maybe one or two options for extra damage or utility at the cost of rare materials. You'll split your playtime between salvage missions with other players and base maintenance, and once all that's done or not needed, maybe you'll take a casual jaunt into the dust to rescue another potential s rank crew member, or mine one of the random singularities, a one-wave salvage side mission worth a good chunk of Kuban. But be sure that you'll probably end up plotting your route for every foray into the dust. Even if it's to do a side mission, you'll want a marker down to guide you to your destination. It's very Death Stranding in that way. Once you've gotten enough materials to support your playstyle, you won't be missing the materials it takes to stage these more casual forays into the field, or even longer journeys, as they never cost as much or as difficult at the end game as they were on your first playthrough in the story, to the point of near triviality. And never in single player will you ever face the level of difficulty you see in most co-op missions. You come to feel like you've really mastered this environment, harsh as it is. And the zombies hurt just as much and punish you just as hard for screwing up at the end game as they did earlier, only now you've got more to lean back on and recover with, both in terms of materials and experience. And I don't just mean Kuban energy here. Anyone who tries to tell you this game's all about the single player has it wrong, and probably just didn't play enough or quit too soon. The single player is just the proving grounds for co-op mode, where the real meat is. Everyone has always wanted a co-op Metal Gear game, and in many ways they've got it sitting right here in front of them. The phrase, cutting off one's nose to spite one's face, comes to mind. If you love Metal Gear, you should have played this game already. This is maybe the most replayable Metal Gear because you simply never really stop your first playthrough. Once you understand that most of this game balances itself through attaching a cost to all player activities and a higher cost to the higher power activities, you start to see why asking players to pay for a second save slot makes sense. First off, you don't have to pay a single extra dollar to earn SV coins, as you're given an allowance for just logging on during the weekends, and you can earn them through the monthly events as well. If you save up enough, you can purchase a second slot to make a second character, but that slot will also share a warehouse with your first character, including all the consumable materials for upgrading your weapons, crew, and base, all the rare ingredients you spent so long hunting down, all of those things will be kept. None of that progress is lost with the new save slot, and in this way it's not really a new save slot. It's an extra base, like how the Phantom Pain allowed the player to purchase extra FOBs with MB coins to increase their resource gathering. Your character constantly is accruing plant and animal materials along with the daily and weekly rewards, not to mention what you can earn with your expedition team, and getting another character gives you another set of all these things, and so that's balanced with the in-game currency of SV coins. If you want to progress faster through the end game, a second base camp can help with this, but it's not something that would be balanced to give you right off the bat without any barrier to accessing the extra characters. It would make managing your base instead managing a set of bases. So as far as in-app purchase style games features go, it's hardly predatory and definitely not as oppressive as umpteen YouTube personalities made it out to be. You can also change your avatar's appearance and gender anytime you want by simply replaying the first mission. The monthly events are great too. I've only played in three of them so far, and one was a base defense themed event that didn't really have an associated co-op thing with it, but each event gives you specific activities you can do to earn battle points, BP, which you can use to unlock special items like cosmetics, some select upgrade items, and music tracks to be played in your base camp. I've heard a few people say that if this game had the Metal Gear moniker dropped it might have sold better, and they might be right. But this game is as much a Metal Gear as Peace Walker, as Ground Zeroes, as even Acid was. Every Metal Gear takes a certain perspective on the meta of gaming in some way. In 2016 to 2018, Metal Gear in the tactical game genre was dead, and everyone was playing some new Battle Royale. Metal Gear Survive asks you to craft your own unique playstyle for what suits you, and instead of bottlenecking all that progress into stale metas from competitive multiplayer, Survive fans out its metagame several times wider than you ever saw it being in single player, and then it asks you to join your progress with other players to the greater mutual benefit of all. Instead of playing some homogenous build that's been overtuned and overused, players are encouraged to diversify their ability to bring something unique to a team and find new ways of working together. I'd say that's a healthy perspective to take in that context for a game in 2018. 96.2% of all players have at least one achievement in this game, so at least they've booted it up. 
less than 32% of all PC players have survived the single player story as of this writing. Interestingly, the first achievement is for crafting your first item, the Crappy Pipe Spear, at the beginning of the tutorial section after all the intro story finishes playing. At the end of that tutorial, you come to the top of a building, revealing the washed up remains of the Diamond Dog's mother base from 1984 behind the wreckage of what will soon become your base camp in the middle of a big old desert plain. Once this image is framed from the camera pulling back, the game's title logo displays and triggers another achievement that 95.4% of players have. A full 0.8% of players, and for 10,000 players, that's 800, could not make it through the tutorial. Maybe five minutes of gameplay with a handful of enemies presented to you in controlled circumstances geared towards ease of learning. A few thrusts with the spear, and they were done. These gamers may be a small few, but you can bet at least some of these few will have been vocal about it. I submit the type that shouts disingenuously about a game they didn't even play is exactly the type to quit in between the beginning and end of a game's tutorial. This game was certainly not made for everyone. It was made for fans of Metal Gear Solid V, people who were familiar with how that game felt and played, and it was made for fans of the Metal Gear series and all of its main entries and spin-offs. But it was also made to pull in people bored with Fortnite and Call of Duty, people who wanted something more cooperative and less about negative conflict after negative conflict. It's made for people who enjoyed Left 4 Dead and that game's style of four-player cooperative zombie action, or maybe even Warhammer Vermintide or Dark Souls fans. The Lord of Dust is a very perplexing villain for a Metal Gear game. It's the apex of Nanomachine's son. The Lord is a giant crystallized mass of super dense, sentient, hive-minded, parasitic nanomachines that have covered the Earth in the future. We're there in the 22nd century, but the dust has begun to eat its way back through time as it has some way of opening wormholes to other times and places. It uses this ability in a very clever way to maximize its edible material by eating Earth in the future, then jumping back to only just before it arrived to eat the world again in its past, jumping back again and again with a kind of multiverse forging effect creating a chain of these closed off time loops where the entire world ends over and over again, spitting out links in the chain like a sick snake wrenching up the bones of its digested prey, until we get pulled in from 1975 to near the beginning of the chain's creation, which is chronologically at the end, and we blast the infection with some railgun laser therapy along a tactical application of an AI delivered poison pill. On an allegorical level, it's like we've gone into the bowels of Metal Gear's dead corpse found some kind of parasite trying to eat the corpse and subdued it as some kind of post-mortem immune reaction. It makes me think of the scene in A Princess Bride. He's only mostly dead. And oddly, also Interspace, where a character named Jack is an inadvertent host for a miniaturized human-piloted nanodrone. I have studied the zombie creature as it appears in film a decent amount, certainly more than most people, and I must submit that the zombies in Survive are indeed true zombies. You see, the zombie mythos was born out of colonialism and slavery, from stories passed among slaves who were terrified their bondage would not end at death, and that their master's yoke would persist into the afterlife, going so far as to even animate their corpse to work longer still in the fields. Modern film and TV zombies, thanks to George Romero's Night of the Living Dead, don't cleave as stringently to this older mythology, and may or may not in each modern story's case even have relevance to the zombies' colonialism-rooted nature in any form. However, here in Survive, these Kuban zombies are explicitly people who have died in the Metal Gear universe, been infected by the Dread Dust, which is seeping into the timeline from the future, and been reanimated in order to carry out the task of turning the world into one, or as Seth calls it, paradise. Of course, it's a false paradise, one where all autonomy is non-existent. All individual impulse and perspective is lost to the will of the Lord of Dust. It's the classic utopian folly offered by Unitarian warnings like Brave New World. The mythology of colonial masters disallowing their subjects to die and forcing continued slavery towards their usually notably capitalistic goals fits perfectly layered with the death of Metal Gear. In fact, zombies are a perfect device for the game. What killed the franchise more than the massive profits Konami was pulling in from mobile gaming between 2011 and 2015? Those profits weren't really just coming from Konami, they were coming from the masses. Konami just promoted the guy who made the profitable game and fired the guy who was spending a ton of money on a game that wasn't even done yet. They kinda had a horde to deal with and Hideo was putting defenses up where no real attack was imminent. 
People play these mobile games because like that 0.8% of quitters in the tutorial, people will quit anything on a whim if they see something shinier that's in reach, even if it's obvious bait. Why did people not buy more Metal Gear games? What about the people who drove 80% or more of Konami's profit margin through the mobile gaming trend? Who's really to blame for their behavior? Were those mobile games really better than Metal Gear to the tune of the inflated dollar amounts theirs and other games' monetization structures made possible? Perhaps it's too soon to tell the cause of such a recent huge phenomenon as the meteoric rise of mobile gaming alongside predatory monetization practices, but I think its role in the waning of Metal Gear's popularity cannot be discounted. But this game isn't predatory. You can get everything you need to play this game by playing this game. You are indeed cast in chains at the game's onset, but they show you where to find all the stuff to craft the keys that you need to shed your bonds. Predatory is a term reserved for games that require you to dole out cash to progress further past a point in my eyes, and indeed there are certain barriers to your progression that you could overcome faster with the use of SV coins here, but you can also overcome those barriers just by playing the game at a regular pace like everybody else does. Nobody's really getting an unfair advantage by paying for a boost or for SV coins. I mean, they're still helping you in a co-op match if you play with them, are they not? Everyone that had something to say about Survive seemed to be more concerned with communicating their perception of Konami's behavior at the time, or their love or scorn of Kojima and his game series, rather than communicating any concerns or criticism about this game itself. I think Konami and the staff that made this game knew this was going to be the reaction no matter what. So, they leaned into the hate, and they made the game on the cheap. That's kind of why I've made this whole essay, because playing this game and coming to enjoy my time with it has brought me into a weird place in regard to how everyone else seems to act and feel when it comes to this game, Kojima, and even Konami itself. So I'll always be a Konami fan, because I'll always have the memories growing up playing Turtles in Time and Sunset Riders on my SNES with my buddies. Konami has a bunch of my favorite games and franchises under its collective belt, and I'm happy if not a bit surprised to add Survive to that ever-growing collection. Metal Gear has died, but it's not gone. It's still right here, surviving with the few dozen dedicated players I've been privileged to get to know over the past few months. The franchise has vanished in a puff of smoke, going from hundreds of thousands of players to almost none, seemingly just sitting in a box in a corner, not having moved for years now. Or maybe it has some stealth camo. Metal Gear Survive takes place on the beach of Metal Gear, all of the beaches from Death Stranding, and that's why it looks like underwater and survive, because it's the seam and Death Stranding itself is on the other side of the beaches, of which there are several layers, but Gilda's misinterprets of layers of hell, but in fact...